science and that's the the most premier uh, uh, institution of India and of, uh, not just in India but globally in the world and uh, he also happens to be the chairman of the center of uh, nanosensors and uh, uh, engineers. Nanoscience. 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 I was. I was the founding chair. I'm founding chair. chair. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 And just to give you a little brief, you know, before uh, I want to uh, hear a little bit about, you know, uh, Professor Pratap's journey into rats, uh, just to give all of you a little brief about uh, how uh, his journey has, has been, you know, starting from the uh, graduate days or the school days or uh, the college days, you know, because that, that is perhaps what you would be able to relate the most. Uh, he uh, uh, basically he did his, uh, uh, I guess his, uh, your BTEC from IIT Kharagpur, right, Professor? Yeah. 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 And then uh, he went on to do his uh, masters, like many of you who has already gone through that process or who is going through that process. Yes, he, he has done his masters uh, from University of Arizona. Is that so? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then he went on to do his PhD uh, from Cornell University. And then uh, he, I guess he did, the, did some, uh, um, uh, some some teaching st uh, stint at uh, the Sibley School of uh, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Cornell yeah. University, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And then later on, I decided to come back to India and he joined uh, ISC sometime around 1996. Isn't that so? Yeah. Yes. So, and uh, what I am more interested in, you know, but before uh, going into that story a little bit, uh, just to give you an outline of uh, all of you of what we are going to talk about. So the topic is romancing with research, and I kind of like stole stole this topic from a very very interesting uh, uh, you know presentation that Professor Pratap has for his new coming uh, students, and he is a, a musical presentation that uh, you know I I. I I don't know whether that's uh, available online, but if it is available, people should no. really go through no, it. It's not. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but yes. So uh, I stole that topic from him, sort of. So it's his copyright. <laughs> and then what we did was that we thought that okay, why don't we talk about uh, right from the beginning when the journey starts, when you are about to think about whether. You would even want to do a PhD or not, or you are so excited to do a PhD and you're choosing your uh, college or your department or your, you know specific professor with whom you want to work with, and then right from that stage till the ending stage when you are actually done with your PhD and you are looking for a job and so on. So uh, this this entire journey would be full of. Uh, uh, ups and downs and there's all sorts of this uh, uh, you know aspects of how you can actually fall into each one you know as you go through your research how you fall in love with that and at the same time it's a bumpy relationship right so we will talk about all these things and what to do what not to do primarily what not to do and what to be careful about and uh, so that that is the theme that is where we will uh, like to roam around tonight. So, uh, but before we go there, Professor, I would like to know how did you even come your 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 romance? Let's start with your romance with research, right? At a personal level. So, when you were an, an undergrad student at IIT Kharagpur, which is one of the top universities in India, and at that time, you know, how did it trigger that that romance for yourself? Okay. Great question. Um, so uh, I guess uh, people could be from uh, all over the place. Yeah, so right, right, all over the namaste, which is time invariant greeting. Um, doesn't matter whether you are in the morning zone or afternoon zone or evening right. zone. Um, right. Uh, uh, so Rish, thank you for uh, inviting me to this forum. Uh, My pleasure. This is, subject, this is a subject that I love and uh, I would love to chat about this with um, you know uh, your audience so uh, my own journey um, you know like uh, most 
students, I think that somewhere along our education, we get uh, inspired uh, by some teacher, you know. Um, in my case, it was in 11th and 12th in high school, you know, my okay. junior and senior year in high school, which we call 11th and 12th. Um, there was a fantastic physics teacher, you know, his name was uh, Professor Akhtar uh, at Patna Science College. Okay. And he was just an amazing teacher, amazing teacher. You know, uh, 11th and 12th, you understand that kids are of, uh, you know, age, maybe 17, 16, 17, we were of that age. 100 kids sitting in that class, and it used to be pin drop silence. And then, because he was such a great teacher, 100 other kids from the other section also used to come and uh, attend his lecture. Okay. Wow. So, an absolute pin drop silence. You know, he taught us mechanics, and that's when I fell in love with mechanics you know mm -hmm. i said wow you know i mean this is this is so good and um, you know my love for mechanics that uh, you know sort of started then it you know uh, nucleated you know in in crystal growth we call it nucleation right um nucleated at that point and then it got strengthened when i went to IIT Kharagpur. Mm -hmm. um, again, I met by chance a great professor of mechanics there, you know, Sopan Majumdar. And uh, it was unbelievable that uh, from strength to strength, you know, my interest in the subject just started going up. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was, I was eligible to choose any subject I wanted mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. my first year. Uh, but mm -hmm. I stuck with mechanics because that sort of spoke to me, okay? So you fell in love. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. And, you know, surprisingly, I did uh, better uh, in the exam in other courses. You know, I had A's and in mechanics, I had B, okay? <laughs> the subject mm -hmm. I loved the most, but there was a reason for it. You know, in the exam, uh, there was a question, final exam, and there was a question, you know, and this is the exam for which, you know, students were preparing and I was reading India Today, you know, uh, just a magazine that night because I thought there is nothing to read, you know, I know, mm -hmm. I know the subject. So, what do I need to study? You might say that that's a little bit of a cocky attitude, but <laughs> whatever, you know, it was and uh, all my friends were coming and taking my notes and stuff like that. So in the exam, there was a question, which was a tough question. And it, it sort of just, uh, uh, you know, bumped me. And I said, OK, you know, if uh, this question I can't solve, I can't say that I love mechanics. So it doesn't matter to me whether I mm -hmm. solve other problems or not, which I knew. All the other problems I knew. I said, how dare there be a question on the exam that I can't solve? So I yeah, that, that you have to skip. Time. Yes. I spent all my time just solving that one problem. And, and uh, you know, after that, I um, <laughs> sort of got a B, but I, it didn't matter to me at all. You right. Know? right. I was very happy that I was able to solve that problem. And then, uh, you know, I went to do master's. I went to University of Arizona because there was a big shot at that point in my eyes, in my perception. You are still an undergrad. How much you know? You know, yeah. this guy had several books and he was chief editor of a journal. So I was, I was completely right, right. smitten. So I wrote to him and he wrote a long letter back to me. So I said, wow, you know, I have got a letter from this gentleman. So I went there to do master's. But the school was pretty easy for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the mass, when I was doing courses, I was getting straight A's without, uh, you know, working hard. <laughs> so I started doing a lot of uh, parting, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, that was, it was becoming sort of my degenerate life there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so much mm -hmm. of parting and going to bars and whatnot. And uh, so would you say that your love life was going a little bit? 
shaken up <laughs> yes yes because i wasn't uh, feeling challenged enough hmm. and uh, you know so after a year i realized that what am i doing with myself you know this is not what i came to us for um, mm. i didn't come here to just be by the barbecue uh, you know <laughs> full barbecue and uh, drink beer and you know go to discotheques and stuff like that that's that, that wasn't the idea right <laughs> which um, which was happening because i wasn't challenged enough so that's when i said no, I to get out of here and uh, then i applied for a phd to Purdue, Caltech, and Cornell, and I got all the three, and then I chose to go to Cornell. Beautiful place, by the way. <laughs> Very beautiful place indeed. You know, yeah. Uh, what a campus! It's mm. a, it's probably the most beautiful campus. Uh, yeah, it's more like a hill station. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Place. Yeah. So that's uh, that's how I went to do PhD, and once I reached. Cornell and that department, which was a fantastic department, theoretical and applied mechanics. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing experience I had there. You know, great faculty members, fantastic uh, environment in the department. You know, completely scholarly environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of fun. I must give you one example from uh, my PhD uh, qualifier exam. <laughs> so, yeah. In the qualifier exam, uh, it was all oral. We had to go to three different boards, okay, one after the other for our qualifier. And uh, there were professors sitting in each board and they would fire questions at you and you're supposed to answer. So in one of those boards, one professor asked me that, okay, you know, and I had been there already by uh, for one semester. After one semester, mm -hmm. you were taking this qualifier. Mm -hmm. So uh, they knew me, professors knew me. So uh, one professor said, okay, RP, tell me, uh, you know, there was only three minutes left in that panel. Okay. So he said that I don't have enough time. Tell me what is force, <laughs> okay? Mm. And I said, uh, Professor Burns, if you want the high school definition of force, I can give you that. But this question has bugged me so much that that's why I'm here. I don't know what is force. I don't really know what force is. And that's, you know, I have come with one of those expectations here that probably during my PhD, I will understand it. You know, what is force? And, uh, <laughs> you know, so other professors um, loved the answer. And Professor Burns said, OK, just to make a reality check that we are not bluffing, give me the highest <laughs> definition of force. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, I did. And, uh, you know, so I had great time. I had great time during my PhD. I worked with uh, very intense uh, intellectual uh, Moments. Yes, yes. Uh, worked with several faculty members. Had had fun teaching. Had fun researching. So yes, right. That's how my journey began. Great, great. So let's come to the the first thing. So you know, let us be honest about it. It was you who put you know who came up with this idea that this it, let, let this today's theme be romance with uh, with research. Yes. And uh, we decided that we will start from the very beginning, right? Yeah. And I am pretty yeah. sure there are there will be a good number of people who are right now watching, and you know, a lot of people actually watch after this, and many of them would be already committed to do doing a PhD, or they are thinking about doing a PhD, and they have so much of uh, ex expectations and so much of dreams and so on and so forth. So let's start from the very beginning of uh, the moment when you think that you would be falling in love with something, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And what are the dangers and how to go about it? Right. I, I think it's a very pertinent question because many a times you find that uh, students apply for uh, you know admission to graduate school uh, without thinking about it. Okay. Uh, you know, just because they are graduating and they don't like anything else or they don't have a job or something and 
so they think that okay it's cool to apply for phd why not there i think that's that's not uh, the right thing to do mm. okay mm. Uh, you got to understand what you are getting in okay mm. Mm. Um, and uh, research is not something which is everybody's cup of tea so how do you figure that out you know so it's it's like yeah you know i mean you you see somebody uh, and you say oh i've fallen in love with this person you know just because you saw that person <laughs> and love at, very, love at first sight <laughs> right and you you know so it could be love at first sight but the very first date you go on and say hey, <laughs> not for <Yeah>. me right <laughs> doesn't work so how do you how do you judge you know whether that you know this this career is for you or not or uh, you know whether you should get into research or not so there are some basic things of course everything changes with time so it's not like what i'm going to say is the foolproof criteria that you use and that's that's it you know no you evolve with time too things evolve with time your taste changes but you should ask yourself that do you find pleasure in figuring out things right that is the basic thing about research do you find right. pleasure in figuring out things right the pleasure and, in investigation right yeah yeah i mean does that give you a kick when you figure out something in research a lot of it is about observation you know observation mm-hmm. very keen mm-hmm. observation are you a keen observer you know that's another question i'll ask myself am i a keen observer you know there are people who are just happy go lucky you know that and nothing wrong with it you know yeah you yeah. have a lot of professions which are good enough you know for for uh, such kind of attitude too right but no if you want to be a serious researcher then you have to have an eye for observation now right. do i have to have from the very first day can i learn it when i get in yes you can but at least you have to have a non zero component of it in you, <laughs> you know, yeah. when you start right right so this is something that you must know uh, do you find pleasure in uh, figuring out things are you a keen absor- uh, you know observer of observer. things also can you stay with a problem uh long enough okay so can you mull over a problem in your head for long enough time okay now uh we all do that you know if something is bugging you you will do that for days on end you know that you are thinking about that problem but that might be some personal problem here you are talking about problem of a completely different nature <clears throat> okay so can you hold a problem in your head for long enough that is very very important right. for research okay and most importantly if you are going for phd are you willing to work on something for 5 years with very little money right it's 5 years of your prime life okay and the money you get is just sustenance right you know yeah that's sustenance it. yes yeah that's all you get so if you have you know i mean it's unfortunate but if you have a lot of uh, financial responsibilities which i have found uh, which i see mm-hmm. some of my students have then it puts incredible amount of pressure on them you know mm-hmm. um, and that's not that's not pleasant okay because mm-hmm. research requires quite a bit of focus it requires that kind of dedication if you want to do right. well you know of course you know you eventually graduate you will have a thesis you'll you know but that's not what we are talking about we are talking about romance with research right okay so when you want to have romance with research you can't be so worried you know about everything i mean imagine going out on a date with somebody and you are thinking that oh this person is she going to or is he going to order uh, 
you know, an expensive food or something that you can't pay for. You know, if, you are, if on your on your way to the restaurant, this is what is bugging you, then you know, it's not yeah. going to go very well, right? So, uh, yes, these are very pertinent questions that one must consider uh, mm -hmm. when taking a plunge. I, I also want to uh, bring in another aspect to that thing, you know, before we move, before moving on to the next topic, which is that a lot of people think, you know, that uh, if you are good at something, if you are cracking, let's say, high school problem or call underground problems or even, you know, uh, then you would be good at research. You know, Not I want to know, uh, yeah, a little bit from you Not about that. Not true at yeah. all. Um, we have had great research students who had very mediocre grades, okay, um, not very good grades, but they were fantastic researchers. They were the people who, uh, you know, all the things that I was talking about, yeah. that they loved solving a puzzle, you know, uh, they, they loved, they got a kick out of, uh, you know, figuring something out new that, you know, other people don't know. Right. And uh, some of those students are not very good at taking exams. You know, exam mm. has a different uh, yeah. sort of setup. You know, it's a fixed time in that time. Have you learned how to use the formula? Have you used it a number of times? You know, do you have all that pattern recognition in your head? Right. There, and um, there's a time management aspect that you were saying right. in exam. Yeah. So that's a different training, you know, a different kind of skill. It's useful, but does that guarantee that you'll be a good researcher? Absolutely not. Mm. Okay. Um, that's a different uh, track. We have had uh, university toppers who came with uh, excellent, you know, fantastic grades and didn't do very well in research. Right. right. So right. we have seen it. We have seen all that. So it's not necessary that, uh, you know, if you are very good at cracking exams that you will be good at research no right let's come to the second point uh, uh, professor Patap, which is that uh, you know uh, we have to let's say that once we are into this stage we make sure of all these things you know all those uh, the flags that we one has to be careful about we enter the we enter the journey begins the love affair begins right mm. now we, yeah. one has to make sure that the romance doesn't fizz off in right. a sense, and, and and the primary aspect that probably would go, govern that is how you are choosing your mentor or your supervisor and how you are choosing the research problem, right. isn't it? So these right. are the two different dimensions here, right? which will right. probably govern that, yes. Yeah. Extremely important. The two things that you mentioned are extremely important. You know, I would say that pretty much decides uh, your your life research life okay later. Yep. again you know uh, let me put a note or caveat that uh, exceptions are always there right mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. there will always be exceptions that even if you didn't have a good mentor even if you didn't have a good advisor you can turn out to be a great researcher even if you had a bad problem to start with you can learn. all of that is true but for most people mm -hmm. you know uh, it doesn't go that way. Mm. Choosing an advisor is a very important thing. You know, a graduate school advisor or your PhD advisor has to be, uh, you know, that, that cliche, friend, philosopher, and guide. You know, that's, that's the combination you are looking for. Absolutely. That if you get that, you are all set. You know, a, a great advisor is somebody who doesn't solve your problem but stands yeah. by you okay right continuously encourages you tells you what the world is like you know what this whole field is like brings that perspective to you brings her or his own experience of years of research okay to bear upon your thought and mm. why is this problem important? You know, you are just beginning. You may not realize that, yeah. you know, a problem is very important. 
Why is it important? So as an advisor, it's my job to uh, show that importance to students. Right. And also remember that by the time you are doing PhD, you are a full adult, right? So you can't be treated like an undergraduate student. So there is a major transition there. And many mm -hmm. students have a hard time actually making the switch. You know, for the first That's so time, true. you're going to be respected as an adult. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so yeah. far you were just given instructions. Do this, do that, bring the homework, mm -hmm. you know, take this exam. None of that happens, uh, you know, at PhD level. Now, slowly, you uh, start getting treated as a scholar as an equal you know it, the transition takes place in your five years when you start from there to when you are when you are graduating we take you as a colleague right right i mean if you are not fit enough to be my colleague i haven't done my job to, you know to mentor <laughs> you properly right so uh <clears throat> it's a mentor is very important but even more important is what kind of research problem you're going to work on. Mm. Now, uh, unfortunately, there are situations where students don't get a choice. You know, somehow, uh, you know, let's say that you are applying for uh, a graduate school to, you know, some university, you know, in the world. And you go there and it turns out that the faculty member has support for you, financial support, which you need financial support for problem X, you know, that some project that that uh, faculty member has with a mm -hmm. research grant, and that's the problem that is there. And you jolly well work on that problem if you want support, right? Right. It is, however, possible, you know, that problem you may not like, but it is possible that you do that problem for supporting yourself. And, you know, like Einstein, you know, you work on on a problem that you actually love, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not that you already have that that kind of problem, because it takes a while to figure figure that out. Figure things you out. Know, what kind yeah. of, you're like, you know, there is a, a, a very nice uh, essay. Uh, this is this was a talk that uh, Richard Hamming gave in 1986. And it's, you know. Anybody can find that, you know, Bell Labs guy, Richard Amin, you know, famous right. guy in coding theory and information. So uh, you can you can uh, look up that uh, essay. The title of the essay is You and Your Research. And he makes such a compelling argument that what kind of research problem you should work on, that has to be the most important decision. Hmm. You know? So um, if you choose a problem that engages you, right, that tickles your bone in a sense, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it engages you, you find it interesting, you find it engaging so that, you know, even when you are in a bar sitting with a yeah. beer, it's a, yeah. back, yeah. that processor is, you know, going on. <laughs> and you might all of a sudden jump from your bar stool saying that, ah, that's what it is, you know. Right. <laughs> you exactly. About, right. Exactly. So uh, the problem selection has to be really good. And when you select a problem, then, you know, it's also uh, partly your advisor's uh, role mm. to show you that that problem is from this field and this field is like this you know today mm. that's what mm. where the field is this is the front line of the field mm. you you sort of learn about the culture of the field you right learn the history right. of the field you learn the evolution you know, right and you know go back to romancing you know so when we say romancing people always think of dating you know that's uh so if you are really serious about a person, you would like to know about the persons. Yeah. You know, uh, person's past, person's family background, person's cultural background, because that's how you uh, sort of start gelling at yeah. different levels. Starting from the person's childhood. Correct. Correct. And that's what uh, research is like too. So you would like to know the field. Who were the 
pioneers in the field, what their life was like, what was their thought process when they come mm. up with, when they came up with this theory or that theory, right? Reading mm. about that is so interesting, so, so invigorating, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think that these are very very important points when you when you think about research. Get you know basically get deeper, right? Mm. You know, mm. in yourself at deeper level. Right, right. And one one thing that you mentioned, uh, uh, Professor, that uh, sometimes uh, you know what happens is that your research uh, selection question, uh, the research question selection is very much related to the funding, right? right. The funding sources right. on. And right. sometimes you end up feeling like, hey, what am I doing? Although I'm doing right. something on it, but and this happened to me personally. I can I can I can very much relate. I I was working on an NSF funding, uh, NSF funded project and. Uh, I was not really able to relate with it. But then what happened gradually is that I, I got a wonderful set of derivatives out of it. Right. You know, correct. And that, correct. that happens a lot, I guess. Right. That so, happens a lot. You see, there is no problem which is a bad problem. You know, it's, mm. it's just the way you do it, <laughs> I guess. Right. Uh, problems have a lot of depth in them. You need to get right. to them. And when right. you're looking for that depth, invariably you find what you call derivative you know it's like it's a it you are going to the woods you know you don't yeah. know there is no path defined there that's what research is right there is no path defined there so while you are making path for yourself all of a sudden you see that hey to the right it looks really interesting yeah, yeah that a new dimension opens up right and you take a turn right there and then you find that wow you know all of a sudden, it's like finding a window in your house which you never opened. And you open that window and you look out and you say, my God, you know, it's like there is a whole world out there that I didn't even know that it existed. That's what research is like. So right. it's about engagement with the problem. You know, if you engage with the problem, you will find treasure trove at some point or the other for sure. You know, you just need to keep your... Uh, mind open for it okay right right and have let's see patience. yeah yeah let's see before going to the next uh, uh topic let's see if we can see some questions sure i yeah so i have uh, one question from uh vidya sagar uh vidya is a very regular uh you know we call it the club member <laughs> so to say and he said that uh you know his concern is that uh he wants to do uh, his PhD in educational technology from one of the IITs, and uh, his what he feels is that you know there's just too much of stress on the academic marks uh, that somebody got uh, during the admission process in the PhD in in, in most uh, reputed institutions in India or in any other place, and why is that so? If uh, whatever we were discussing, that if research is uh, more about the, the the intensity of how you would be investigating a particular, you know, whether you have that investigative nature or not, or whether you have the observational nature or not, and right. then yeah, then why is so much stress on your grades uh, which it's you a, got? Let's say yeah, it's a fantastic question that has bugged me for last twenty four years that I have been a professor, you know, at Indian Institute of Science. And it bugs me even now, but I, I do know the answer that why it is, you know, publicly funded institutions mm. have certain responsibility to uh, government norms and regulations. Okay. Mm. So the question is this, that if I have 5,000 students applying to the institute, how do I shortlist them? on some objective criteria you know so mm -hmm. now if i am going to shortlist first of all for shortlisting you need some criteria which you can say okay either you qualify or don't qualify right, right. and then comes the interview right so unfortunately there is no criteria that you can think of you know which will be objective enough to uh, uh, stand the scrutiny through RTI, Right to Information Act, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and at the same time, also uh, under measure your uh, 
investigativeness or or so to say your research that's, that's aptitude. Right. You know, there is it's it's very very difficult to make uh, an exam which will do that. Okay, therefore uh, this criteria is met that okay, you know, we take students through gate, right? Mm. Gate. I'm not a fan of gate, but you know. you have to have a criteria and it's there that okay if you have uh, scored fairly well in gate then you can qualify for uh, you know to be called for interview now just think of it interview you can only interview so many people right mm -hmm. so you call 300 students if you have you know 10 seats or 20 seats right <laughs> uh, for phd now i have to bring that number from 5000 to 300 based on absolutely. some absolutely and that's where this happens you know it is it is uh, uh very likely that uh, private universities right or uh, like universities in the us they don't mm -hmm. have to do this rti i can't ask them that hey why did you not select me and select uh, sorish for your phd program on what basis and they are not under any obligation to answer to you <laughs> right whereas here we are and that's the that's the reason why it is done this way it's right. it's certainly not perfect but unfortunately uh, you know for now we have to live with right and the other thing is that for the candidate you know it's just one interview for, but for the panelists is like 300 interviews <laughs> that's right that's right yes right that's 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 the thing yeah i will come to you tani tanina is uh, you know she comes and she is actually a research scholar from one of the universities in pakistan and she mm -hmm. has a very uh, yeah, good pertinent question but since we are already going to talk about that topic right now so i will first let's discuss that topic and we will come to this question okay so sure. yeah so the next uh, thing is that you know so let's say that you are uh, well, the first place you know where you actually get to that seriousness is where you have to submit your research proposal uh, and that needs to be accepted and then you go into the comprehensive exam thing and yeah. that is where you you know that the pressure suddenly starts you start feeling the pressure of research and then once the comprehensive is a comprehensive exam is done and then comes that uh, phase of uh, you suddenly start feeling what is published or perished or something unfortunate but that's how things right. are at least yeah and right. uh, and that is where you know starting from the you know beginning of your research proposal submission to the comprehensive to the post comprehensive this is where the relationship is now going to go back right right and right. this is where there are all sorts of different uh, emotions that that come up right and you know professor it would be really really nice if you could actually let first but you know let us go through that journey and then how to tackle with it right yes it is it is very important phase uh, and it can stress you out you know there is no doubt about that um, i think that you know like normal life you know you have to remember that okay you are getting into a sort of a career and if you are really serious about it then mm -hmm. you have to uh, find uh, you know enough ways to stay with it stay mm -hmm. with it you know there is no there is no career where things go just smooth yeah right? there is just no career yeah. yeah there is nothing like that right uh, uh when you think of smooth sailing we think of uh, flights and you know that flights are so bumpy right <laughs> so uh, yeah. even there there is turbulence so you know in, for graduate school you have to remember that uh initially when you are taking courses and stuff and uh, mm. you may or may not be doing very well because courses tend to be tough right. also if you go to a good school there will be a lot of competition you know you have <laughs> toppers from all over the place <laughs> so you can feel uh, depressed you know uh, right that happens so you know to keep yourself motivated you must mm. you must invest 
in other hobbies you must have something else uh, on the side going on you know you could be a sports person and you keep your sports going there is by the way there is nothing like sports to overcome stress right you know uh, no matter how how much down you are you go and play a really good game you know where you are sweating like crazy or run yeah. for 10 kilometers and you come back you know all of a sudden uh, different hormones have kicked in the body and you start feeling good right yeah so i think that that is very important also uh, keep in mind that these courses uh, even if you did badly in a course just two three years down the line it's not going to matter at all okay uh, how you did in the course you have to prepare yourself for comprehensive exam when you go to a comprehensive exam you you don't do well i mean almost nobody does well in comprehensive exam it's given <laughs> you know uh, and uh, i remember one of my professors in the comprehensive exam telling me after the exam i felt terrible i felt terrible and uh, after the exam i went uh, and talked to him and he said remember this is supposed to be a humbling experience we want to <laughs> let you know <laughs> yeah you you have that story of richard feynman also getting so much that's of right. trouble in it yeah that's right you know so um, and it's a, <laughs> you know at that point it obviously feels absolutely terrible i i don't yeah. think that i ever felt so bad after an exam me too same here <laughs> and, and and let let me tell you you know i mean one of the committee members so you know for comprehensive and all you know that you have a syllabus right you know you you discuss a syllabus with, with the right. committee members so i discussed the syllabus and we had set aside one course he said okay don't want me to uh, ask and i said okay let's keep away stability okay so he said fine so we had written that off from the syllabus and in the exam he says that rp i you know despite whatever discussion we had um i can't forego the temptation of asking you this question <laughs> and that was unstable <laughs> and you know i had not even looked at any single formula on stability because we decided that this is not going to be part of the exam mm -hmm. and the moment he said that i almost froze you know <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is uh, this is something that happens in the exam too but you know you realize that you are being prepared for right. for the future you know this is part of the training it's mm. like uh, you are being hardened as you know right hardened absolutely steel, right um and you have to go through these processes so mo more than these exams you know i would worry more when what happens is you are working on a problem it's not getting solved you know you have weeks you have couple of months five months six months pass by and you have no result to show mm -hmm. right it's not that you are not working but you know the result you are expecting is just not happening that's when frustration sets in and that's why it is extremely important to have parallel tracks of work okay let us say that you know many students do this mistake that uh, if they are working on experimental uh, things then they become just full experimentalist all they want to deal with is the experimental setup you know uh, and running experiments getting data no analysis or or mm -hmm. no mathematics or no uh, modeling that's a mistake don't do that right mm. because you are you are building your career you, you want to be a great experimentalist by all means but remember that you are preparing yourself not to be a technician you are preparing yourself to be yeah, a scholar yeah yeah right. right so if you are preparing yourself to be a scholar all parts of it you know modeling knowing the mathematics behind it knowing the physics behind it is as important as doing the experiment yeah right so if you have those parts also going to some measure you may, it it may not be uh, you know in this in the same measure as your love for experiments but you have that then when the experiment is not working 
you could be working on the modeling right? right you could be working on the computation and you will get some results there you will feel more enthused that you know it's not right. a dead end right so it's right. important to have some parallel tracks going when you right. are in graduate school. and i guess by parallel track you are not meaning like two completely different pro no. problems i guess no. yeah no no parallel tracks of work <laughs> right you know then mm -hmm. as i said computational work uh, theoretical work uh, mm -hmm. experimental mm -hmm. work right mm -hmm. and, and you could just be a theorist but you know if you are a theorist then you know you are working on one problem usually as a graduate student you always have office mates you know right but i had i had such a great office mate um you know we are we are friends for life so in our uh, in our office we used to discuss each other's problems right yeah so I yeah got that so is so interested, i got very interested in his problem that he was doing he got very interested in my problem that i was doing so much so that uh, when my first phd student joined i had my first phd student work on not the problem that i was working on but what my friend was working on because i was right about that problem right and right. i wanted to work on it. so you know you it's also becomes educational you educate each other okay right um right uh, so right. this is important that you have things going on so that you don't get uh, uh, you know uh, sort of stressed out in one right. uh, issue and uh, then you see dead end you don't know what to do and uh, you start losing motivation okay yes That's right the and right. of course you know um, also it's important for advisors to keep, uh, keep right. an eye. you know see look uh, it's as unfortunate as it is not all advisors are the same and there are pretty bad mm -hmm. advisors too who are only interested in getting papers out of you and they don't care whether you are uh, you know alive or dead it happens, or yeah. you know, it, that happens too and the 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 sooner you get out of such relationships the better for you mm -hmm. okay. you don't want to be in in such situations in a, in a stressful situation right, right. and that right. that actually that actually brings me to these two questions, one from uh, Tam Tamina, uh, which is how to come up with failures or mental pressure during research, and the other two, how sh uh, other from Poonam, uh, from IIT or Bombay, how should we follow self-motivation in research? So one thing we have already discussed, you know, having parallel uh, work going uh, so that you always get a, a sense of success is always right. going on. Right. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, Professor Pratap, there are other aspects also that one could be, you know, there has to be some sort of an extracurricular or some good hobbies or some creative uh, pursuits. I said that. I said that, that you right. have to invest in your hobbies. You know, you right. have to have hobbies uh, on the side. You know, it could be writing, it could be uh, sports. I personally find sports very satisfying, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, whenever I feel stressed, I just go and run okay right or, or right play a good game and uh, right come right you <clears throat> right right but uh, even having good friends right with right absolutely you, you can uh, have heart to heart chat with whom you don't uh, feel that you have to hide you know what is going on in your research and it is bugging right. you know sometimes just this core dump you know <laughs> yeah, problem right, dump, right you know right just right right uh, you know, relieve stress. Right, right. And and what one thing that I I want to tell all of you is that you are not the only one. Right. To to, to go through right. this thing. Actually, chances are that ninety nine percent of researchers have gone through. I would put that number even higher. Have higher. Gone yeah. through, uh, you know that experience for sure. <clears throat> Let me give you one example. I can't, I, you know, just remember. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. From my master's uh, time. So I was working on my uh, thesis uh, research for master's. And, you know, I was getting nowhere. You know, my advisor had given the problem and I found it against my self-respect to go and ask him, you know, that, okay, I'm not getting the, uh, I'm not getting results. What do I do? 
I said, no, that's not happening. I, I have to solve it. So I'm working on it, not getting anywhere. Six months pass by, you know, uh, I, I have written computer programs. My program is running, but all wrong answers, you know, not, not the kind of answer <laughs> you, are, you are expecting. Well, or yeah. or, uh, yeah. You are expecting. And I was getting desperate, you know, um, and uh, I wanted to graduate. So I went to another professor uh, who was on my committee. And I was just telling him that, look, professor, his name was Dadepo. Professor Dadepo, I don't think you'll understand my problem. You know, I've been working on this problem for six months. And I'm not getting anywhere. And mm -hmm. it's so frustrating. And uh, Professor Dadepo looked at me and he said, you're right. I don't understand your problem. And then he pulled out a uh, pad from his drawer right in front of me and he put it on the table and he said, here is a problem I have been working on for 18 years and I haven't solved it. So obviously I don't understand your frustration for just six months of work. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, so research is like that, you know, it, it takes time. You have to have patience, but it is very, very rewarding. Okay. It's extremely rewarding. You know, when you actually get a result from your research, a problem you are working on, which is the frontline problem. And the, the day you get the result, this realization that probably in the entire world of 6 billion or 7 billion people, you are the only one who knows that is <laughs> an amazing feeling. You know, you right. are the only one who knows that, right? At that point. Right. Of That's course, true. after that, you That's have to so everybody else knows too. <laughs> but, uh, at that, 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 point, that moment of truth. Right. That moment of truth is an unbelievable uh, feeling. And, uh, you know, you can live on that feeling for a long time. Yeah. You know, it, it yeah. keeps giving you those goosebumps. Right. Okay. Right. So, um, right. so yes, uh, you know, like anything for anything good, you do have to work. And how to overcome those um, dark days, how mm -hmm. to overcome those frustrations, you must have hobbies. You must have, right. you know, good friends. You, you must do other things. You know, mm -hmm. if nothing else, you have your batchmates who are working on problems. I encourage yeah. this all the time in my group that, hey, guys, you know, also help the other person, you know, find right. out what they're doing, working on. Right. And if you have right. some skill to help with, help, you know, at least you will get second or third authorship in that paper. <laughs> you know, something <laughs> will come out of it. Yeah, but a lot of times, that that other thing comes, uh, Professor. That sudden you you start helping somebody, and suddenly this new idea comes in. That's which right. Which might be useful in your work. That's right. Yes, absolutely. You know, so that's why it is important to be in that uh, you know ecosystem. Right. right. You are investing in the ecosystem, and you are investing in yourself too. Yeah, that thought waves you have to keep absorbing. You that's know. right. That's right. Right. You go to you know. Uh, Many times the students say that, sir, why should I, why are you sending me to this uh, seminar? Yeah. Okay. You insist that we should attend the seminar. This seminar is in some other field. You know, I, I won't understand. And I keep saying that, go and see why this mad person, whoever this is, has <laughs> spent 20 years figuring out, 20 years of your life has gone into figuring out this problem. Yeah, that's not why, a joke. why have you spent 20 years? Is it worth it? Just listen to them. See why somebody would spend 20 years figuring out something. Right? Just listen. Right. To them. Now, the point is that when you go to the seminar, it's not just that, that you are listening to why this person has spent time. You get something out of it. You get some idea out of it all of a sudden. You know, completely unrelated field. But you get an idea that, aha, if this, right. if this person could do this, why can't I do this? Right? In right. My Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes.
So, uh, and I guess uh, before moving on to the last topic, I guess uh, one one more thing that I have seen a uh, lot of students doing it. Please don't do that. Which is that stopping yourself from going to your supervisor. Don't don't delay the process when you feel that well you are stuck somewhere and you require certain discussions. Right, right, absolutely. You know, um, I think you should invest in that relationship you know mm -hmm. you should try to mm -hmm. find that relationship um, mm -hmm. or take it to a level where you are very comfortable you know talking to uh, like i i i have always maintained this i always tell my students that there is no problem that you can't discuss with me you know mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. it's a academic problem or your personal problem you know mm -hmm. treat me as a friend you know, who right. has only your good at, uh, you know, at my mind. So right. <clears throat> many a times, I mean, you know, you, you have problem, even in your relationship, you know, yeah. try me out, try me out. You know, I have tons of experience, if nothing else, I can tell yeah. you, you know, from right. experience that, uh, uh, why you are facing what you are facing, you know, <laughs> right. uh, it's possible. So. And, and in the research problem, you know, many a times my students come and uh, ask me question for which I have no answer. I don't know. Okay. It's, a, it's a research problem. I keep saying that if you ask me a question for which I know the answer, then it's not a research question. It's right. a homework problem. It's right? a homework problem. Right? It's an assignment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, because in research, we don't know. And uh, I try, you know, with with some of my students i have had really good mm -hmm. luck in this uh, respect that uh, so we don't know what the answer is but you know i would tell them that okay you guess and i guess let's both of us guess what the answer will be okay and uh, and see whether that's what it is you know when, mm -hmm. once we do either the experiment or mm -hmm. the simulation then see mm -hmm. but you know sort of guess you play a game with yourself that mm -hmm. Do I understand this problem uh, well enough to make a guess, right? Yeah. So you are then, making a guess based on your education, not 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 arbitrary guesses, right? Yeah, not a wild guess. Yeah. That yeah. okay, you know, uh, I I feel like uh, you know, uh, angular momentum will be violated if it did blah blah blah. You know, I'm just giving you a, mm -hmm. a, a term, here. and therefore it should happen like. And lo and behold, when you when you actually find uh, the answer, then it's not what you guessed, right? It's totally different. Yeah. So um, you know, of course, as an advisor, I have had a lot of fun uh, playing this game uh, with the students <laughs> because if I turn out to be, you know, correct, then I say, <laughs> you know, and that's why I'm a, your advisor. And if I turn out to be wrong, then I say, wow really good you know it beats my intuition too let's sit down and figure out right so you win both ways right it's a win-win right. you know you learn something new when it does not match with your previous intuition right 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 absolutely absolutely and that's, so. where, that's where you make progress in research that's where you move frontiers of knowledge mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so um it's it's very important to have that kind of comfort with your advisor that mm -hmm. you know you can go and 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 discuss and you know i have students who uh, tell me that you are wrong you know this is this is not what it is uh, what it is you know uh, it's going to be like this okay and i'll say great you know if you are right i'll buy a beer <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. right fantastic right so it's it's fun to be and when students start telling you that you are wrong then you know in the heart i feel so mm -hmm. happy at that point because then you know that the students have started maturing yeah. you know they mm -hmm. have they mm -hmm. have gone to the level where mm -hmm. now they are able to Thank intellectually you. assert themselves in the field mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. where you want them to be you know mm -hmm. At the end of the day, my pride is that my student is standing in an international conference or meeting somewhere 
and giving a lecture and is standing his ground no matter who it is in the audience mm -hmm. right that's the pride of an advisor so that comes that practice is with me right start with okay. me yeah this brings us to the uh, final topic which is like how to now keep your uh, let's say that you are done with your phd and uh, you got the degree and it's all yay and it's uh, this thing is this journey is sort of over but then how to keep your romance alive after that you know um, in your career and that career can be either in academia or it can be in corporate research right so how do you stay on with that romance after so the, after the period? i yeah. i think that the actual romance with research the research starts only after that after phd okay you know, because uh during phd lots of things you do under duress you know <laughs> not many things are under your control but after phd it's all under your control and uh, you know you do what you want to do right so right, right. i think that uh, you know it, it's like this that uh, again let's let's uh, draw a similarity with relationships you know the first time you start dating it may or may not be right you know you don't know and suppose even if you get into serious relationship and you get married or whatever you start living in together it's only after you have been with a person for a while when you understand uh, every aspect of the person that you really fall in love with you know right. and you learn to respect the person despite mm -hmm. knowing all their uh, you know all the uh, shortcomings all the shortcomings and still you respect the person then you know that this is it is a lasting relationship that's that's what real romance is about okay mm -hmm. that's what right. real romance is about it's not it's not infatuation anymore okay? right absolutely it's a real romance so um i think that's what happens you know by the time you graduate you have sort of uh, got a feel for the field you know by then if you are in the right place doing your research by then you would have met several top people in that field you know through conferences through meetings you know you would have gone to these things and you would have met big wigs of that field right that's my responsibility to make sure that my students know people in that field and they have <clears throat> gone to the right places right after that you know what the landscape looks like right, right? and right. that's when your you come out with your porsche and say okay now i want to drive in this landscape you know in this in this field and uh, this is going to be my journey so that's right. when the actual romance starts so it's uh, it's very very important that after phd you have a good reconnaissance of the field you know mm -hmm. you already mm -hmm. have that you already know who your uh, you know uh, peers are passengers and... are right mm -hmm. co travelers are in this area and uh, you can have you know from there onwards it's you who writes the destiny right uh, let's take some final questions uh, on this specific topic uh, so there is one question from rizwana parveen Hi, Rizwana. Uh, just let us know from where you are from uh, and which university. Rizwana. Uh, Rizwana Parveen. She's and... probably from Singapore. Okay. Okay. She's probably my student. Oh, really? So <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm. Uh, okay. I mean, I okay. okay. You're, you're guessing. Okay. Okay. So her her question is, how can? Uh, yes, yes. She is from Singapore. <laughs> there you Rizwana. Go. Yeah. So her question is how one grad student can prepare uh, himself or herself for a faculty position in top academic university. What are the factors that matters the most? Okay, so, uh, you know, top universities, uh, you know, it's a very high bar, you know, to, to, to get uh, academic positions in top universities simply because everybody wants to go there. So it's, it's like mm -hmm. anything else, you know, uh, how to be an Indian cricket team. It's, it's not any different, right? right. So um, <clears throat> I guess 
um, most places look for um, good publications, which is an evidence of your research productivity and your research creativity. Okay, so if you have published in good journals, if you have, uh, you know, uh, published something which has an impact in the field, that's what carries a lot of weight. You know, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, lots of uh, papers. You know, I mean, we have had uh, people applying who have written, you know, they are applying for a tenure track assistant professor position and they have 60 papers. And I don't think that we look at those things very kindly. You know, um, mm -hmm. they are in some factory which just publishes papers, 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 you know. <laughs> but you look for uh, substance that what is it that you have done? Okay. And that is very evident from uh, the papers you have published as first author. And uh, once uh, that bar you cross, then when you are called for interview, then it becomes very, very clear, right? Whether you are the person who knows that or it's your advisor who knows that <laughs> area. Right, right, right. right. Um, nowadays, you know, there are very big groups uh, in the world, research groups where people publish in science, nature, all mm -hmm. that. So there will be, you know, 20 authors or 15 authors, you are one right, of them. Right. So it looks very good on your CV that, oh, you have a nature publication or a science publication. But that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, if you are not the first author, then it's very hard for me to figure out what your contribution is. Right. right? Now, when you come for the interview, then it becomes very clear when you make presentations, when you are asked questions. Mm. At that point, what one is looking for is, is this researcher somebody who has developed a view of the field, you mm. know, and knows what are important problems and is working on one of the important problems in the field. Has mm -hmm. that kind of maturity come in? That's what uh, most good universities are looking for. Right. The deep insight that one has to yes. have. Right. The deep mm -hmm. insights. Right. Right. Uh, and let me see if there are some other questions. Otherwise, uh, if we are already a little past time, so we will then wrap up. Uh, there's an interesting idea. It just struck me, you know, by uh, Kushaji Rao. Uh, the question is, uh, is it possible to develop a nationwide platform for matching students' interests with advisors before PhD admissions? That would be really a nice, you know, app, so to say. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a very very interesting idea indeed, and uh, it should be done. You know, in in some sense, nowadays we require that students go through faculty profiles, and mm -hmm. uh, then only they they contact or uh, apply. We ask mm -hmm. questions during the interview admission interview that okay, so why did you apply here? You know, right. What work interests you? Whose work interests you? What in that person's research interests you? You know, so you you are trying to find that out, and you are right that you know this this matchmaking will be a very good thing, right? Um, probably your uh, you know the kind of uh, AI work that you do, Sarish. With yeah, I was just thinking maybe this can be a feature <laughs> in right. Tracks. Right, this will yeah. be fantastic. So right. it gives you candidate faculty members for my interest, right? If I'm mm. interested in something, then it searches and tells me that, okay, here are five faculty members. Now mm. you figure out whether you will qualify in that institute or not is for you, right? You mm. know, but at least mm. you know who are the people. Very good idea. I like that idea. Right, right, right. Okay, so it was wonderful uh, discussion tonight. Uh, and I, at least I thoroughly enjoyed it. And so did I. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. It's, my, it's our pleasure actually to have you here. So, uh, what? Uh, so we are going to wrap up tonight's uh, discussion, and we hope to bring yet another uh, very special guest for next week uh, weekend Saturdays on on Saturdays with Solish. 
till then uh, stay very very safe and take very good care of yourself and uh, your family and uh, thank you so much professor rudrapata for uh, you know, such a short notice for uh, honoring us with being our guest tonight pleasure it's pleasure you asked really good questions i loved it you know <laughs> okay. brought all my the back from my <laughs> yeah great thank great you. thank you bye bye everyone bye, bye and have a have a good night bye